This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by HearHis.com The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lea, Book 6, Practice, Chapter 4, Part 1, The Secret Prison. The Carceles Secretas, or Secret Prison, was the official designation of the place of confinement during trial of those accused of heresy. It formed part of the building of the Inquisition, so that the prisoner could at any moment be brought into the audience chamber without being exposed to public view. Such a case as Carranza's, where confinement was in a different place and the inquisitors went there, being wholly exceptional. The secret prison was exclusively one of detention, the Casa de Penitencia, or punitive prison, being wholly different, and the contrast between the two, the laxity of the imprisonment as a punishment of the guilty, and its rigor toward those whose guilt was yet uncertain, is not the least of the anomalies of the holy office. As a general rule, it may be said that imprisonment followed arrest, and that admission to bail was an exceptional favor of the early time virtually withdrawn afterwards. In 1530 we have an example in the case of Antonio de Parejo, a priest whose offenses did not amount to formal heresy, who was released by the Toledo Tribunal from the secret prison and given the city as a prison on bail in a hundred thousand maravides, furnished by his brother Vizcanio, who renounced his fuero. Parejo, moreover, took a solemn oath not to leave Toledo, on his own feet, or those of others, and that a certain Mateo Perez could always tell where he was to be found. Various regulations in 1535 and 1537 allow bail in cases where arrest had been made on slender evidence, but in 1560 Valdez ordered that no exception should be made when the charge was of heresy. For those held in less serious charges, there was less rigorous treatment. The inquisitorial jurisdiction extended over a wide range of offenses, more or less trivial, and the tribunals did not care to be burdened with the expense of prisoners who were not likely to seek safety in flight or to warn their accomplices. For these, there were various grades of confinement. Under the practice known as aplaceria, of assigning the city as a prison, or the offender's house, or the less rigorous prison for officials under trial known as the carcel de familiares. Thus, about 1640, a writer says that in cases of blasphemy, the accused may be assigned the city as a prison, or, if the offense has been especially shameless and scandalous and reiterated, it may be proper to confine him in the carcel de familiares, or, if flight is anticipated, even in the secret prison, although this is a rigor not now practiced. He adds that when astrologers spontaneously denounce themselves, they are not thrown into the secret prison, but into the carcel de familiares, or are given their own houses or the city as a prison. Friars often, unless the charges were particularly grave, were assigned for detention to the convent of their order, in accordance with the general policy of guarding the honor of the church. When the prisons of the tribunals were crowded, convents were also sometimes used as subsidiary prisons, as they were provided with cells for detention. In some tribunals we also hear of carceles medias, carceles comunes, carceles publicas, for offenses not of faith. These appear to be similar to the carcel de familiares, and, in all of them, confinement was held not to inflict the indelible stain of the secret prison. As a rule, the prisoner in these was not debarred from communication with his friends, although he might be confined sin comunicación. In fact, the whole matter lay at the discretion of the tribunal. We have seen how, in the passionate conflicts of jurisdiction, inquisitors sometimes wrecked vengeance on their opponents by inflicting on them the infamy of confinement in the secret prison. So, on the other hand, culprits charged with heresy, when their proofs seem slender, 
were sometimes placed in the carceles medias, and then, as the trial advanced and the evidence grew more compromising, were transferred to the secret prison. Thus, in 1678, Angela Perez, on trial for Judaism by the Tribunal of Toledo, was moved, June 22nd, from the medias to the secretas. The same occurred at Valladolid in 1697, in several cases of Judaism, and, as late as 1818, there is an example at Seville, where Ana Maria Barbero, tried for superstitions and blasphemies, was similarly shifted when the case reached the stage of formal accusation. In compassionating the hardships of the secret prisons, the horrors of the jails of the period must not be lost to sight, and in the comparison we shall see that those of the Inquisition were less vile than those of other jurisdictions. It is true that the ancient laws of Castile proclaimed that prisons were meant not for punishment but for detention while awaiting trial, and that Ferdinand and Isabella in 1489 ordered a weekly inspection by the judges, who should listen to all complaints made by prisoners, a provision repeated by Charles V in 1525. Yet the petition of the Cortes of Madrid in 1534 shows how little attention these enlightened enactments received, and the condition of the jails can be conjectured from that of Valencia, where, about 1630, Pedro Bonet, secretary of the Inquisition, was confined, while a competencia was fought over him, and when he was surrendered to the tribunal, he was in such a state that he died within three days. It is certain that the Inquisition regarded its secret prison as more humane than the royal jail even in modern times, for in 1816, when Don Agustin Perala was tried by both jurisdictions for certain irreligious and anti-political propositions, the Tribunal of Madrid, in procuring his transfer to its cells, asserted that this was to relieve him from the inevitable hardships of the royal jails in which he was confined. This may well be true, for the secret prison had the reputation of being less harsh than those of the spiritual jurisdictions. In 1629, Fray Diego de Medina, when brought before the tribunal of Valladolid for uttering some radical heresies, explained that in his convent de la Victoria, he was kept in the stocks of the convent prison, and he had made the heretical assertions in order to be transferred to the milder treatment of the Inquisition, whereupon he was dismissed with a reprimand. We might regard this as an isolated case, were it not for a similar one about 1675, where a cleric, confined in the Episcopal prison, pretended Judaism with the object of being removed to the Inquisition. In this instance, the tribunal rebuked him and remanded him to the tender mercies of his bishop. Whether the secret prisons were better or worse than the royal and ecclesiastical jails, they were dismal and unwholesome places of confinement. Of course, as structures, they varied greatly. Few, if any, of the buildings of the Inquisition were constructed for its use. In Saragossa, the royal Castile of Alaferia, in Barcelona, the royal palace, in Valencia, the archiepiscopal palace, in Seville, the castle of Triana, in Cordoba, the Alcazar, were occupied and utilized, and elsewhere such buildings as seemed suitable were taken. Those which had served as castles had dungeons already provided. In the others, cells were constructed. Under the circumstances, there could be no common plan and no general standard of convenience or healthfulness. It is to be hoped that not many were like that of Palermo, where there were great subterranean caverns which the inquisitors constructed cells for their prisoners, but probably not much better was part of the secret prison of Toledo, of which we get a glimpse in 1592. Marie Rodriguez, after lying there for nine months with a year-old baby, asked an audience and begged to be removed from her cell, for it was entirely dark and she and her companions suffered greatly, and they were sick, to which the inquisitors coldly replied that what she needed was to discharge her conscience and save her soul, and, for the rest, she should have justice. 
That the prisons should be unsanitary was a matter of course at the period, and the death rate must have been large, especially during the pestilences, which are of constant recurrence in the annals of time. Statistics are of course unattainable, but the records frequently refer to the death of prisoners during trial. In Valladolid, the report of 1630 to the Suprema includes the names of twelve deceased prisoners. With the existing state of their cases, and in the great Madrid auto de fe of 1680, all the dead who were burnt in effigy, to the number of eight, had died in the prisons. Confinement in the secret prison was regarded as one of the gravest misfortunes that could befall a man. In consequence of the indelible stain that it inflicted on him and his descendants. The Consulta Magna of 1696 dwells eloquently on the horror inspired by such imprisonment and the injustice of subjecting to it, at the whim of an inquisitor, those whose offenses had no relation to the faith. In support of this, it adduces the case of a woman of Seville in 1682 who had some words with the wife of a secretary of the tribunal. The alguenzil was sent to arrest her, and, in her frenzied desire to avoid imprisonment, she threw herself from an upper window and broke both her legs. The consulta adds that those who were guilty only of an insult to a familiar were not infrequently thrust into the deepest dungeons of the secret prisons. The terror thus caused was rated as one of the most efficient powers possessed by the Inquisition. When, in 1622, Gregory the Fifteenth granted to the bishops concurrent jurisdiction over the crime of solicitation, the remonstrances addressed to him from Spain represented this dread as a deterrent much more powerful than anything that the bishops could bring to bear. In the royal instructions to the Duke of Albuquerque, then ambassador at Rome, it is argued that the fear of the infamy wrought by the prisons of the Inquisition restrains the hardest culprits. Power such as this was liable to constant abuse, even after the Suprema had deprived the tribunals of initiative, and, when the attention of Carlos IV was called to it, in 1798, by the case of Ramon de Salas, a professor at Salamanca, he proposed to require special royal permission before consignment to a secret prison. But Lorente tells us that court intrigues prevented the enactment of this wholesome reform. The cruelty which kept all prisoners in chains was not peculiar to the Inquisition, for we have seen that it was a common practice in the secular jails. An Italian visiting Madrid in 1592 describes three prisons there, that of the court, of the city, and of the priests, and says that all prisoners, no matter how slight their offenses, were fettered. It was evidently a novelty to him, which he sought to explain by the insecurity of the buildings. None of the instructions refer to chains, but a chance allusion of Pablo Garcia shows that their use was assumed as a matter of course and this occasionally presents itself in the trials as when, in 1565, Fiere de Bonavilla asked their removal to enable him to change his drawers, and, in 1647, Alonso Velasquez, who had escaped and was recaptured, describes how he rid himself of them. While thus the Inquisition is not to be taxed with special cruelty in following the universal custom, it had its methods of inflicting intolerable hardships in special cases. When a heretic proved to be impotent, a mordaza, or gag, was applied to him. What was the exact form of this instrument of torture, it would be impossible to say, but the allusions to it show that it was regarded as a severe infliction. When thus worn in prison, it was not a mere precaution against the prisoner spreading his heresies, for an order of the Suprema prescribes that no one be allowed to speak with him except the confessor sent to him in the night before his execution, while even then the mordaza was not to be removed. There was another device of pure cruelty, the pie de amigo, an iron fork or crotch fitted to the chin and secured by a band around the neck or the waist, 
to keep the head up and rigidly fixed. The customary use of this was on culprits scourged through the streets or paraded in vergüenza, but it was sometimes employed to heighten the sufferings of prisoners, either through mere malignity or to induce confession. When the celebrated Dr. Augustin Cazalla was burnt in Valladolid in 1559, envoys from the tribunal sent to him the afternoon before the auto de fe found him in a dark cell loaded with chains and wearing a pie de amigo although he had freely confessed recanted and begged for mercy in fifteen ninety nine in the case of jacques pinzon a french calvinist in toledo who made a disturbance in the prison fifty lashes were administered and a pie de amigo was ordered April 20th. At an audience granted him six months later, October 19th, he is described as still wearing it, as well as two pairs of fetters, and, in this case, the pie de amigo extended from the neck to the right hand. In spite of fetters, escape from the secret prison was by no means rare, but it was not often finally successful, for the organization of the Inquisition generally enabled it to recapture the fugitive. A description of the culprit was at once distributed, with a mandate ordering the civil authorities to summon everyone to assist with the familiars and commissioners to scour the roads under pain of excommunication and five hundred ducats. Thus an army was promptly on foot, Every suspicious stranger was scrutinized, and the fugitive was usually soon arrested and returned. In the jurisprudence of the period, breaking Gao was held to be a confession of guilt, and some authorities held that this applied to the prisoners of the Inquisition. But Simancas and Rojas agree in regarding this as excessive severity. If the fugitive was recaptured, the ordinary practice was to give him one or two hundred lashes. His trial was resumed and carried forward to the end. If he was not recaptured, he was prosecuted for contumacy and abstentia. Numerous cases attest to the accuracy of this, although when the culprit was a person of condition, the scourging was replaced by stricter imprisonment and increased severity in the sentence. For those who eluded recapture, the prosecution for a contumacy had but one ending. The absentee was held to be a self-confessed and impotent heretic, fit only for the stake. Thus, in 1586, Jean de Salinas, a Frenchman on trial for Lutheranism in Valencia, succeeded in escaping with a number of fellow prisoners. He was not recaptured, the necessary edicts of summons were issued in due order, and as a contemptuous heretic, he was burnt in effigy, January 23, 1590. Although, at the time of his evasion, his case had already been voted on, with the insignificant sentence of arbugation de Levi and six months seclusion. The cruelest feature of inquisitorial prison discipline was the rigid denial of all intercourse with the outer world. In the secular jails, the state always had the right of imprisoning sin communication, where there were special reasons for such rigor. But in the secret prisons of the Holy Office, this was the universal rule, enforced with the utmost solitude as an essential part of its highly prized secrecy. We have seen that, from the moment of arrest until delivery to the jailer, the prisoner was not allowed to exchange a word with anyone but the officials, and this was continued with the same strictness when he was within the walls, so far as concerned the outer world, to which he was as one already in the tomb. He could learn nothing of those whom he held dear, nor could they conjure his fate, until, after perhaps the lapse of years, he appeared in an auto de fe as one destined to the stake, or to the galleys, or to perpetual prison." It would be impossible to communicate the sum of human misery thus wantonly inflicted by the Inquisition during its centuries of existence, misery for which the only excuse was that communication with friends might aid in his defense. 
According to inquisitional theory, the presumption of guilt was so absolute that all measures were justified which would hinder fraudulent defense. This strictness was not observed at first. The instructions of 1488 call attention to the evils arriving from communication with prisoners and order inquisitors to see in future that it is not permitted, except by the admittance of religious persons for their spiritual benefit. This received scant attention, for the instructions of 1498 order alguaces and jailers not to permit the entrance of wives or kindred, and whatever is sent to prisoners must be examined to ensure that no letters or messages reach them. Even inquisitors and other officials were forbidden to speak with prisoners except in the presence of another official. This rigor was relaxed for an order of the Suprema in 1514, provided that no one from the outside should speak with a prisoner, except by special license of the inquisitor, and then only in his presence and that of a notary. And a further concession in 1536 was that if a prisoner desired an interview with his wife, the inquisitor, if he saw fit, could grant permission. These slender concessions, however, were soon withdrawn, and in 1546 officials were reminded that only those permitted by the instructions could be admitted, and that any contraventions would be severely punished. Surreptitious communications were difficult to prevent, and so little were the officials trusted that two locks were required on each cell door, so that the alcalde or jailer could not enter without his assistant. The success with which all this was enforced is boastingly alluded to in a report of the Valladolid Auto de Fe of May 21, 1559, where it is declared that the inquisitorial process was so secret that no one knew what was the offense of any prisoner till he appeared on the scaffold. The increasing importance attached to this is revealed in the instructions of 1561, which take for granted that all access from outside is forbidden and which regulate the interior life of the prison with the same object. Everything brought to a prisoner, whether provisions or other matters, was reported to the inquisitors, who decided as to its delivery, if allowed. It was minutely examined to see that it transmitted no message. If it were found that prisoners had communicated with each other, no pains were spared to find out how it was done and what had passed between them. When prisoners were confined together, if their cell was changed, they were kept together and not scattered among others. The segregation from the world was maintained to the end. At the auto de fe, no one was allowed to speak with penitence, except the confessors assigned to them and those who were burnt were sent to their last reckoning without being allowed to learn what was the fate of those whom they held dear. When penitents left the prison after the auto, they were subjected to the avisos de carceles, in which they were examined under oath as to all that they had seen or heard while confined, and were ordered under heavy penalties to reveal nothing of their own experiences. All this was not wanton and cold-blooded cruelty, it was merely the pitiless enforcement of a rule which was superior to all the promptings of humanity. In the fulfillment of the rule, the most minute regulations were multiplied and reiterated. The alcalde was warned to be especially careful about his wife and children, who were never to be allowed to see the prisoners, no one was to be admitted to the cells except the sworn attendant who served the food, and when, as in some tribunals, it was served uncooked for the prisoners to cook, it was not to be wrapped in paper, but was to be brought in earthen pots. In serving food and in cleaning cells, the door of one was always to be securely locked before opening another. No windows, which looked upon those of the cells were allowed to be opened. In Mercia, the water-carrier who served the Inquisition was not allowed to enter the courtyard to fill the jars, but to do so from a window opening upon the court, or to have the water in a room where the jars could be filled. 
no precaution was too minute, no watchfulness too careful, when the supreme object was concerned of isolating the prisoners from their friends and from each other. End of Book 6 Chapter 3 Part 2 Recorded by HearHis.com